Hello, welcome to the Friday, June 26, 2020 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. And a couple of you asked for recordings of the Tech Tuesday workshop. Well, we are not recording these workshops because there are these breaks for exercises and such. But what I'm doing instead is I'm recording the content of the workshop in three separate videos. Make the first one live today that explains how to install the honeypot. Was hoping to get the second one live today as well. Well, uh, if not today, then uh, maybe tomorrow I'll make the two other videos live. And those two other videos will go over how to use our data and uh, also a video about a little bit the background of Internet Storm Center and the Shield. And yes, EXIF data is back. EXIF data is comments and other associated data that you often find in image files. Now, this type of data has been abused heavily in the past to smuggle data across networks. The latest example was found by Malwarebytes, and they found that favorite icon, these FAF icon files that you often see displayed in your browser, Officers, uh, toolbar are being used uh, to actually transmit code. They found some credit card skimming JavaScript that uh, by itself actually doesn't look all that malicious. At least you don't really know what it's doing, but it is loading a remote fav icon file, then parse it for EXIF data. And for example, the copyright field in the EXIF data may then contain additional JavaScript code to execute. Of course, the Goal here is to fly under the radar. Nobody's inspecting uh, these uh, files because everybody assumes they're just uh, little images. And yes, network connected video devices are in the news again for what else? Well, backdoor passwords. This time it's Geovision, a Taiwanese manufacturer of video surveillance systems and IP cameras. And the hacker news is reporting how security company Acronis found a number of vulnerabilities in this gear, in particular, an undocumented root password. So standard IOS style vulnerabilities and something that you probably do want to pay attention to if you are using any of their gear. And then in other news that really surprises nobody at this point, uh, Unit 42, that's the Palo Alto Networks research team, did discover a number of Docker images that are distributed via Docker Hub that come pre-installed with cryptojacking malware that will mine for Monero. Not sure how often this has been discovered in the past, certainly nothing new, but a good reminder to pay attention what you're downloading. Some of these images were downloaded over a million times. And the way they usually trick you into downloading them is that they promise to be sort of fully patched systems or systems with uh, some kind of additional uh, feature that sounds quite attractive. What surprised me a little bit is that uh, one common denominator was that they used Ubuntu 16.04 LTS, which uh, actually is quite old at uh, this point and probably not what you should be using if you are setting up a new Docker image. Well, and since this is the Friday podcast, and I already sort of announced it earlier this week, we do have a special guest today, and that's again a SANS EDU student. Uh, Karim, uh, could you introduce yourself, please? Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Karim Lalji. I'm based out of Vancouver, Canada. I work as a security consultant mostly on penetration testing in Red Team, and I'm a candidate for the master's program at Sands Technology Institute. So great. So your paper was about this uh, criminal organization in Germany called Cyberbunker. Can you give us a little bit background about what this was all about? Yeah, absolutely. So Cyberbunker was operating what we know as bulletproof hosting. Now, usually that bulletproof hosting would refer to 
hosting of darknet sites, for, for example, that are hard to track down either because of the country that they're in or because of the, some of the technological anonymizing controls that are put in place. In this case, the group was actually operating out of a literal military-grade nuclear bunker uh, in Germany. And so in the fall of 2019, police went and raided that facility and confiscated about two petabytes of data. This was servers, workstations, laptops, documents, a whole bunch of stuff. And this included about 6,000 or more darknet sites that were operating, you know, illegal drug markets, child pornography, uh, you know, even things like assassination orders, stolen credit cards, all sorts of stuff that you would expect with a darknet provider. The individuals that were connected to that are in jail and waiting criminal trials. And one of the methods they used to liquidate some of their assets to pay for legal fees was by selling that IP address space to a Dutch company. And that Dutch company, uh, an individual at that Dutch company had a relationship with Johannes and was able to give us access to that network by redirecting the traffic to our SANS honeypots for analysis. And it was a really interesting procedure because that raid took place in September of 2019. And we started our analysis in April of 2020, yet we still saw so much traffic. So that was a real eye opener for us. Yeah, so this was a real unique project in that sense, you know, that we actually got access to this address space. What was it, about uh, 2,400, I think, uh, IP addresses or? Something like that, yeah. There was thousands of them. And it was, uh, a, I think there was uh, two slash 22 ranges and one slash 24 range. So that sounds about right. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what we got there. And uh, so what we did is we set up basically a honeypot to collect the data. So something was responding. Uh, we recorded packet captures of traffic coming in. Now, Karim, can you tell us a little bit about sort of some of the highlights of the type of traffic that you saw there? Absolutely. So uh, one thing I'll mention about the honeypots is that we, of course, had web servers running on port 80 and 443. Uh, we weren't permitted to examine email traffic. So there's nothing listening on port 25. And we also stood up a, an FTP server. So one of the things that we noticed almost immediately was that the Apache logs for the web server had some weird stuff in it. Uh, you started seeing the user uh, string instead of an in place of what you would where you would normally see the HTTP request method. So clearly, user is not in a valid HTTP method, uh, and that string was then followed by what appeared to be computer names. So you would see like John PC or Linda Lenovo or admin PC, and clearly that wasn't web server traffic. So it was it didn't even need analysis. It was naked eye. You could see that something was up. And further analysis pointed down the fact that this was IRC. Um, likely an attacker had set up a, a bot that was calling home over IRC. But because we had a web server there, all of a sudden it started getting logged by Apache. So uh, usually attackers will do things like this to try and thwart any analysis because 80, port 80 is not really uh, too interesting. It's common to have web servers communicating on the Internet. Uh, so there was that, and you know, IRC has been a, traditionally a very common method used by attackers for botnets. Uh, we also saw a lot of encrypted communication going back and forth, uh, and it was a little bit difficult initially to pinpoint, but we were able to pinpoint it down to a specific malware family. Now, with reverse engineering any type of malware, usually you need a portion of the initial exploit in order to be able to figure out what's going on. All we had was the check-in. Uh, because hosts that were compromised are presumably still calling home to their command and control servers, and they were encrypting it. So that calling home is pretty much all we had to work with. But based on the way that that check-in was running, uh, it was possible to pinpoint a very specific malware family. So that, that was very interesting to see how many hosts were still doing that, considering how long the network has been inactive for. Yeah, I think it was something like 7,000 or so different uh, IP addresses that you still sort of saw checking in and asking for commands. And that was specifically just the IRC, uh, 7,000 unique IPs. And if we actually extracted the computer names, assuming that they're actually tied to computer names, which is a very high likelihood, it was over 2,000 unique computer names as well. So that was, that was fairly interesting. So interesting. So some of them are probably behind like dynamic IPs. So Absolutely. you may have gotten like two or three different IPs for a particular computer. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, that, that's really cool. Now, uh, IRC bots was sort of uh, one uh, big thing here. And uh, next, I think there was also this ad network that I found interesting or uh, because uh, you saw 
some of the URL parameters that kind of pointed to the type of sites uh, that were possibly hosted uh, with the Cyberpunker. Absolutely. So there was uh, getmyads.com uh, that were just, and the volume of traffic for this ad network was ex- extremely high. Um, and so that was one of the things that was interesting. And you'd, you'd see like a query parameter in the URL with the, with another um, site in it, which is part of the ad. But like you, you mentioned, there's a lot of them had uh, adult content and some adult content that was more on the illegal side. Um, and it's just the volume. You'll see hosts connecting, the same host connecting to this ad network hundreds of times in a very short period of time. So it's it's interesting to see the volumes just based on the fact that the network, again, was taken off uh, such a long time ago. Um, on that same note, we, had, we found a lot of phishing URLs as well. Uh, one of the things in the in the press release by the uh, attorney general was that there was some mention of the word PayPal, which was interesting because the greatest amount of uh, the count of a specific URL that we ended up finding was actually related to PayPal. And so we didn't hear, I didn't actually know about the press release at that point. I just noticed about 50% of the resolutions had the word PayPal in it of some kind, which was interesting because then when we later read the press release, that corroborated the story. Uh, We also saw some phishing links for things like Apple, um, actually able to use a URL scan to reconstruct one of the phishing landing pages, which we could see was looking like you're logging into your Apple ID. There was also one for Chase Bank as well. Uh, So that was fairly interesting. You know, I just want to note, we, of course, didn't put up any uh, phishing pages here. Uh, Our web server just returned sort of an empty page. So all we saw was basically people still reaching out to these URLs. Uh, No idea if they would have actually given us a username and password, but uh, I guess that would have been the next step then. (laughs) Yeah, Uh, it was just a blank stop page with a redirection. And actually, I should clarify that the, the, the Chase Bank, let's say, phishing landing page was actually not directly coming to the honeypots. It was the IP address where that was resolved. This was a phishing landing page that resided on that IP address at some point. So it was a cached uh, web page. So it wasn't active at the time when we did this analysis. It was active a couple months or uh, weeks before that. Yeah. So um, how much traffic did we see overall? I believe, let me just take a double double check here. I believe it was uh, two megabits per second. Okay. So uh, significant, yeah, significant amount of uh, traffic that, that was uh, still hitting it. Uh, now, uh, as a the people behind Cyberbunker, of course, are currently uh, undergoing trial in, in Germany. I think yep. the trial sort of started a month or so ago. And uh, I've seen sort of one news article where their defense apparently is that uh, they just ran the servers. They had no idea what was hosted on these servers. Uh, any comment? Could this be plausible that they didn't really know what was running on their servers? I mean, it's hard to say for sure, but just based on the volume of data and the type of traffic in all this volume, uh, I would find that a bit strange um, because, you know, there's there's a lot of, of, of botnet communication going on here. And it, it, it does seem odd to me, but I, I mean, it's it's hard to know for sure. But I'll, I'll yeah, it's always hard my to diplomatic answer there. know what someone was thinking while they were looking at all this traffic on their Absolutely. network. Kind of. Like a lot of it was not encrypted. Like some of it, like the botnets traffic, the, the one botnet you saw that was encrypted, but like that IRSC traffic on port 80, that was out in the clear. So that was... Absolutely uh, visible. Yeah. Uh, and there was a yeah, lot so, of uh, there was a so lot any... of Mirai variant. Uh, sorry, we might have to edit this part out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, there was a lot of Mirai variant IoT stuff as well, and there was active discovery scanning. A lot of things that we could see as well. Um, the the press release again mentioned uh, C two communication. I didn't particularly see any of that. Uh, but one thing we should also mention is that. There, the volume of data that we were getting to the honeypot was quite large. So there had to be some kind of a sampling approach. Uh, so, you know, seven days worth of data was analyzed and about four hours on each day. And if we just look at the PCAP data alone, that was about 40 to 50 gigabytes worth of just PCAP data. And that's four hours a day for seven days. So there is a very strong possibility that we, we didn't see everything. So there, there is probably more gold in that, in that gold mine. Yeah, there's a lot of traffic there. My impression was that the Mirai-style traffic that we sort of noticed was really just what 
any host on the internet would have seen. Uh, so nothing really specific uh, to the cyber bunker. Yes, the press release. And just to clarify, it was a press release by the state attorney in Germany as they sort of were getting ready for the trial. It mentioned uh, some command and control servers uh, for uh, Mirai or Mirai variants were running within the cyber bunker. But that may have actually happened a couple of years ago. Like uh, they were operational I believe uh, for at least five years, if I remember correctly. And that was Cyberbunker version 1.0, right? Uh, Cyberbunker version 2.0, which is the one that uh, they took down. Cyberbunker 1.0, which was run out of Netherlands, I think was taken down in 2014. That sounds about right. Thanks for joining me here. Any final thoughts or... Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. It was a really interesting project to work on. I guess one of the, the takeaways for me personally was just, you know, we, we, we talk about some of the phases in our instant handling process and we say, you know, you, you have to be vigilant with your eradication and containment phase. And this is really speaking volumes to what we looked at here. Just, uh, you know, you see these servers that are ripped apart in multiple pieces, probably by German police, but yet there's still so much malicious activity going on. So it, it does speak volumes to how we need to handle this uh, in our own environments as well. Yeah, and in particular, uh, going back to how we obtained access, of course, with IPv4 address space being so scarce at this point, you know, having a slash 22 available for sale, uh, of course, there's some real money in this. That's sort of you know, how they fund uh, their defense now by selling this IP address space. But of course, if you, at this point in time, obtain new address space, you always have to think about, well, who owned that address space before you? And uh, you may have to go through a procedure to essentially clean it up and you know get off uh, various block lists. I don't think uh, we looked at specifically what block lists uh, those IPs were on. Or... No, we did not. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks. And thanks, everybody, for listening. And talk to you again on Monday. Bye.